My name is Jason DeSalvo, and I'm the CEO and president of Federa Guitar Partners, LLC. We're headquartered in Brooklyn, New York, and we've been here for 30 years. The most important resource in any business, but particularly a business like this, where you have very high-level craftspeople, is human resources. Our instruments are almost entirely handmade and you can't build them without very high-level craftspeople. So my partners, Vinny and Joey, who are in their late 50s, they'd like to do this forever. Unfortunately, part of my job is to tell them you can't, not because we don't want you to, or not because you don't want to, but because as you're aging, it becomes impossible at some point. So building the next generation of great craftspeople is probably the most significant job that we have from a resource standpoint and then raw materials. Our raw materials are natural materials. They're largely wood, and we need to have our wood seasoned for a long period of time before we can build with it. So we have to be thinking ahead three, four, five years. What are we gonna build, not next week, but what are we gonna build year two, three, four, and five so that we're procuring those materials now and putting them in a position to where we can use them when we need them. I became a partner at Fodera Guitars in October of 2009. At that time, before I was a partner in the business, the business was financed almost entirely on uh, leverage and high cost debt. Uh, credit cards, personal credit cards, business credit cards. Um, there was a tremendous amount of debt and it was very expensive to the business. When we became partners, part of our buy-in to the business, if you will, involved swapping out that debt for equity, making an investment in the business with cash, paying down that debt. Um, right now, we're financed, the only debt financing that we have is equipment-based financing. So we have two very expensive pieces of equipment that we purchased with debt on kind of lease-based financing. The rest of it is all equity financed, and now we finance things off of internally generated cash flow. So when we're thinking about how to grow, we have to think about smart growth, right? We have to think about how much cash are we gonna generate as a business, and how much of that do we wanna redeploy into the business? versus how much would we like to ultimately take out and have that be the rewards for our work as, as equity investors. Pricing in our business, the way we approached it, although we are theoretically a price leader, meaning we're at the higher end of the pricing structure, um, that's not really the way we approach it. We don't approach our pricing by saying, what will the market bear? We approached it by looking at all of the component parts of our costs. How much time does it take to build? Which person in the shop builds it? How much does that person make? How much do the materials cost? How much is the overhead of the business? And then when you add all of that up, we decided we wanted some minimum level of return. And actually in this business, this is not a very high margin business. Your, your net profit margins in this business, if you can achieve 10 to 14%, that's considered to be very good. It's a business in which you kind of build up, or at least we built up, our prices based on to get that 10 to 14% range of net income, this is what the price has to be. When I first started here, we had a lower price line that my partners had created where a lot of the labor was outsourced to Japan. Um, now, Japan is a very high cost labor market, but a little bit less expensive for this kind of craftsmanship than doing it right here in Brooklyn. A lot of our competitors have outsourced to Malaysia, Korea, China, a lot of uh, the Eastern countries, and as a way of really lowering their labor cost. After a year and a half with the company, we made a decision collectively to even eliminate the Japanese built instruments and now 100% of what we make is made right here in Brooklyn. And we felt that that's what our customer wanted of us. They wanted what we do at the highest level and rather than kind of cheapen our brand and come up with a thousand dollar Federa if you will, we would come up with this standard line which were made 100% in Brooklyn at the $4,000 to $5,000 price range and do what we do well in low volume because that's really what people expect from us. They expect perfection. Determining whether to add a new product or uh, to eliminate an existing product 
has everything to do with just watching demand and keeping your pulse on the business. And myself, Vinny and Joey, the three partners, as well as our team, we each see and are involved with every order that comes in. So you start to get an idea as to what's working and what's not. We're fortunate enough to, you know, knock on wood, not, not have released any duds, but that's because when we decide to release a product, we're doing it because the market's demanding it, not because we wake up one day and say, oh, let's do this. You know, we're being asked repeatedly, it'd be great if you could do that. It'd be great if you could do that. And after enough people do that, it kind of sticks and you say, all right, let's build an instrument based on those parameters. The start to going down the road to failure in business is when you decide to grow for growth's sake, right? You start saying, well, we just have to grow by a certain percent each year. If there's not demand for your growth and you're just trying to push product out there, I don't know, that, that just doesn't seem to ever work and it certainly never ends well, especially if you're kind of at the higher end of the market where really most of your product is demand driven. Our biggest fixed cost is labor and right after labor it's our physical plant, right? We have a production facility that we're in the process of doubling the size of and whether or not anyone orders anything on a given day, that production facility is there and the people that build the instruments are there. And so we're constantly looking at our contribution margin, if you will, as, as a measurement of for each instrument that we build after the variable costs are all absorbed, how much does the sale of that instrument contribute to that overall fixed cost basis? Um, and you have to have a very good hand on that because it's very seductive to build things and grow, right? And so if you did 300 instruments, wouldn't it be great if you could do 500, if you could do 700? But if you're building each one of those and losing a little bit and trying to make it up in volume, that's really not a good equation, right? So we have to make sure that our gross margin is always very stable or hopefully slightly growing um, and that we also keep an overall eye on the fixed cost so that again we try to drop that 10 to 14 percent to the bottom line um, so we, we look at that constantly right now for the first time in our company's history we have a little bit of excess capacity largely based on the fact that we are training and building a team of younger luthiers that will one day take over the work from Vinny and Vadim and Joey, the guys that have been here for many, many years. You have to start to staff heavy in order to have that build so that that human talent is ready when the older people in the bunch decide they can't do this physically anymore because it's a very physically intensive work. So right now, at this moment in time, we're pretty well balanced in terms of what we can do in terms of product delivery and sales, maybe with a slight edge to excess capacity, but we're talking about maybe five or seven percent, not 10, 20 or 30. We're very fortunate in that we've been struggling to try to keep up with demand. Advice to people that are going to be future business leaders are um, do your homework, know your product, know your market. If you know those things really well, you can decide what you have to measure and how you have to manage in order to be successful. I think you have to be fairly passionate about what you do in order to be great at it. So to me, in, in our line of work, we all have accepted the trade-off that you're not going to make the margins that you would make, say, in a software company in a luthery company, but there's a certain excitement and a certain passion that we have about our product that makes that trade-off worthwhile. Know what those trade-offs are for you and be true with them, right? If you're a person that's purely financially driven, getting into luthery probably doesn't make a lot of sense to you. On the other side of the coin, if you're a passionate artistic type, then maybe going and working at a hedge fund might not make sense to you. So it's really a question of knowing yourself knowing your product, doing your homework, and being true to who you are.